Please, Noreen, right here. Well, Hernando, you actually did us all a favor because you only left time for one question for each of you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's perfect. That's actually perfect. It's late, and I know most of us have been here all day and somewhat tired. And today's topic was inspiration for pioneers. Um, so we have had a wonderful day. I mean, we've heard incredible presentations on a variety of topics. We learned about the environment, about society, about youth at risk, new measurement systems. Uh, now we hear this wonderful story you were just telling us. So let me come to you back and ask you very personal questions to each of you. Um, and, and let me start with you, Hernando. And, 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 and this time, I need you to give it to six minutes, just in case. Um, when I think of you, and we've met, we met several years ago, but when I think of you, uh, I always picture you uh, sitting with President Bush in his office, or talking to the world's bankers, or giving advice to Javier Perez de Cuellar or some other world leader at the World Bank, the United Nations, or, of some, or some other place. And yet, here you are interviewing Mohamed Bouazizi all over the Middle East. Why? What is it that moves you? Why are you uh, a pioneer and a social entrepreneur? Uh, obviously a good question because it's hard to answer. Well, one immediate thing that comes to mind is, I suppose, Swiss alpinism. Uh, you want to get to the, po to the point of the mountain that nobody's been there before, right? That's... Uh, you or your Yeti comes in first, something like that. There's something about being there first. I mean, I was educated in this country, and this is a country that has the most patents in the world. You know, something about their getting first. Uh, there's something about being patient. I write on square paper, like all Swiss, with round letters. I'm patient, and I take time for the reward. Um, secondly, probably, possibly, it has to do with, uh, I wish my father had been a businessman and told me how to make a lot of money. He didn't. He was a political exile of Peru. He had been the secretary of a socialist president of Peru called Bustamante. Very good man. International Court of Justice. And we were exiled. So politics was always very much in the mind of my father, though he wasn't a politician. He was a diplomat. And so the, generally the idea of what began, how things began, you know, we got to Switzerland, I think it was about 1948. So the world was changing, and it was a communist world, another world, and Geneva was always a center of international stuff and intrigues, and I would have beer when I went to University of uh, Geneva in a, in, a, in a brasserie next door where Lenin had left his initials and this kind of thing. So I think it has a lot to do with uh, just simply being very excited about where the world goes. Uh, and. Uh, and to me, it's the finding out of categories. So let me just give it to you 30 seconds more. Once I left Switzerland, somewhere in the age of the 30s, and when I finished working for Universal Engineering and the Schweizerische Bankverein, where I was uh, the CEO, as a matter of fact, of that, bu that business organization, uh, we started a dredge, a gold dredge in Peru. And uh, I brought in investors from Switzerland, from Germany, and all over the place, and we went down the river to see are 60,000 hectare concerns. And uh, all along the river, there were people washing gold. And I said, who are these guys? Uh, and they said, chichiqueros. And I said, who are the chichiqueros? They said, they're illegal miners, informal miners. And I said, why don't we kick them out? And he said, because we're 50 and they're 2,000. <laughs> Sick. And that's dominated my life ever since, as I've gone to India and seen the same thing. There's a whole huge social class that we haven't identified and I just can't help but get excited about that day after day. Thank you. Tasso, very similar question, but, but in your case, you're now 42 years old, you said this morning. So you got a long way to go, but you have certainly come a long way already. Uh, when you were talking today about the changes in policies in the Amazon that reduced deforestation from 27,000 square kilometers to 5,000, and how you keep going but then you said, we're going to be successful doing this, so now we need to transfer this knowledge over to climate change and energy. 
What is the driving force? I mean, I can imagine that deforestation is a problem all over the world, and you are one of the world's foremost experts in terms of the policies that are needed to revert it. So why not use that? Why define a new problem and go face it uh, as you are? Maybe if I use the example of the mountain, I would say <laughs> I climb mountains, you know, do high, you know, Kilimanjaro, you know, you know, high peaks. And one of the things that we learn is that you go to the mountain, you, you'll be climbing for, you know, one week, 10 days, just to get that, that point, and then you be there and you'll be seen for 10 minutes max, then you have to come back because <coughs> unless you'll be freezing there. And what's interesting is that you, after you contemplate for 10 minutes you, and you start to come back, you are starting to think on the, on the, the next one, right? Where you go, the, next, the highest one. So m my impression is that I, I'm a little bit addicted to the movement. So I, I, I want to go to the, next, to the next place, the next area. So that's um, um, how, how it works. So um, I think as I develop ways in which I can solve one problem in a certain way, then I think it, what, what could be the next level in, in terms of ambition and so on. So, I, um, yeah, so I think once, because every time you solve a problem in a certain um, magnitude, you will find out that there is something else on another magnitude, and I want to, to dig into that. So that's a... Um, um, I know that's that that uh, what pushed me, but but the other thing is, um, I, I think that sustainability it's it's not actually to find a way in which we can stabilize things forever in a certain way. It's actually a way in which we can be sufficiently adaptive to be able um, to live and uh, um, today and the future under the circumstances that are available. So it's, it's actually to be really adaptive in any movement. Um, and that's how is the dynamics of a tropical forest. There is, there is no such a thing like a, a, a forest that is stable. What, what maintains the, tropic, the tropical forest is really the dynamics, that our trees are dying, other ones are growing up, one animal is eating the other, and as far as you have all of this diversity working together, this makes the forest strong. So somehow it's, I think my feeling of having this movement and jumping from one to another challenge is, is linked to this idea that um, if we are successful to move in all those areas together, then this may bring us the sustainability. And Noreen, uh, in your case, uh, I'm sorry if I sound even somewhat sexist in, in asking this question. But the last thing I would have, the last person I would have sent in to the Taliban is a blonde Canadian woman who had a, le a legal career going in Canada. So h how in the world do you make the decision to go into the highest risk area of the world to work for the youth uh, when you're in a comfortable position and doing well in your own country? Do you see me looking at stuff? Um, I think in my, in my case it was a question of um, a shared purpose. Um, there was an issue that uh, we believed was uh, causing a multitude of problems um, that needed to be addressed and we needed to open debate. And um, <coughs> Afghanistan was the center of the heroin trade. In fact, um, I got Stefan's agreement to go for three weeks. I ended up staying seven years. Um, as soon as I got there, I saw you know, the opportunity to learn and uh, to understand and to illuminate um, and to speak for the people, the farmers of Afghanistan, about their situation. Um, one of the things I've been saying is it feels like uh, some of us are here in a reunion, even though many of us hadn't met each other before and we're um, brought together by the university and also um, by the philanthropy. Um, and for me, I'm, uh, I'm dedicated to and very energized by the sense of community, the sense of, of shared purpose, of sustainability, eco-efficiency, um, and all of the things that we're working on. Um, so it, it felt like I had found a place where I could be effective, where I could 
use my talents and um, my commitment uh, towards the shared purposes of our community. Thank you. And le let me ask you now, Tasso, and, and then come back to the other presenters. Hernando, of course, always tells us how the important thing is that you have capital and how you use it, how you put it to good use in order to not only generate more wealth, but generate prosperity, equity, sustainability. So what are the key assets of the social entrepreneur? Uh, I think the first one, which I think it's, it's common to anyone that was speaking today, is that this, this sense of purpose of what you were doing, it's everywhere there. I mean, you look at us and what we are talking here, maybe you're thinking, oh, these guys are great. They are always doing great things every day. They don't have a boring life or something like that. But I would say that 90% of our time, we are actually doing boring stuff, um, you know, that we have to do day by day. But you do it because actually it doesn't matter to have these boring things to do because actually what you want to achieve is something that has a, a purpose that is very, um, very well defined. So I think that's the first the first thing is to have a sense of purpose of where you're going, uh, very um, strong, and, and, and really don't, don't mind to do the boring stuff that you have to do on a, uh, on a way. The, the second thing is um, you have to be open to, I think Paul said that on a, on a good way, that you, you really need to be open to challenge yourself all the time. Because it, it's, it's very simple. If you identify well a problem and you put a solutions for this problem and put in place those solutions, if you are successful, actually you are changing the reality. And it's very likely that five years later or something, whatever you had in mind and what you were doing that was good and working, maybe will not work anymore in the, in the, in the long run. So you have to be the first one to act at, look and say, you know what? That thing is not working anymore. Let's try something new. And you have to be ready for that. Have comp uh, be completely open to challenge um, uh, yourself. Don't, don't be shy to, to act if the people um, look at you as, as fool because you are changing mind or something like that. So I think that's the second um, thinking part. And the third one is this curiosity to learn about some things that you apparently have nothing to do with what you were doing. So, I mean, I was delighted to learn about, you know, that, I, I don't know about you, but I have no idea that morphine comes from, from you know, uh, the same plant that makes opium. So it's kind of, uh, you know, um, strikes me and, and opened my mind for some things that you could think uh, in, in areas that we also have problems. So, I, I think will be this, those three. This, the third one is to be open, for that, because when you do that, you make a lot of connections. And if I could say a, a last one, not taking too much time, is to be open to work with all stakeholders that could happen. I mean, if you have any prejudice of working with you know, the government, uh, because you don't like the government, or the business people because you think that they will destroy it, then it's very difficult to conform, um, to be in a position that you can really influence what, what's going on. So, to be open to work with the different publics, even if you run on a risk to be um, not well um, perceived by the, the other person, um, it, it will be uh, really difficult to scale up what you're doing. Hernando, your key assets, why have you been so successful? How have you built your position and your capital? And I don't mean the one you have in your pocket, but the one that gives you all this space and credibility to influence the world. Well, first of all, you know, after all my discussions early on in the 80s and the 90s with Stefan, uh, there's something very similar with ecology and what I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, to me, it's all the same thing. Property is essentially about having boundaries. And there's no such thing as life without a boundary. As a matter of fact, the expression of non-life is entropy, where there mm -hmm. are no boundaries. Right. <laughs> So what happens is that life gets organized in small circles. And these small circles can come together to form different molecules and different sets of, uh, of cells. But if you want to protect, of course, 
the jungle and the forest, you've got to draw a boundary around it. Your problem is that it's hard to draw a boundary, but you're only going to get there when you get property. Because the guys who do the, the disastrous stuff are the guys who don't have boundaries. How do you expect nature to have boundaries if the human beings can't put boundary? So you can't go around and say the way Sachs does, for example. Sorry, I don't like him. <laughs> 45, he throws against it, he says, there are 45 things that are important. <laughs> Women's rights, this, this, and the other, and property is one. No, you don't have property, you don't have ecology. You don't have boundaries. I mean, you are from the tip of your toes to the top of your head, one big boundary with a lot of little cells. Some little cells say make a nose, others say make a liver, and they get specialized. Same thing. It's the same thing with human organization. What happens is the biggest enemies are the Westerners because property came as a result of wars, came as a result of democracy. Why should the king have all everything? You know, little by little. And so when it came, they think it's part of nature. Property is man-built. You've got to put in the development agenda. You can't say it's item 45. There isn't one millennium development goal that deals with property. How in the hell are you going to talk to 90% of the people who are dying, even in the Middle East and North Africa, about property? What do you think all the wars are about if it's not about territory? And it's not on the agenda, simply because it's a capitalist word. So you're unfit to define. <laughs> we third worlders can see. Einstein said it. What does the fish know about the water in which it swims? Thank you. <laughs> Noreen, uh, you, 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 chose, you chose an unsurmountable peak, drug policy in the world. Uh, it could be argued that you know, the, the governments are simply not going to let go. So how do you keep at it? What drives you in the end? Um, someone asked me that earlier, and I said, well, somebody's got to hold this candle, so I'm holding it for, for now. But I think qualities that define the, this whole community that I talked about, which is, one, a sense of responsibility. Somehow, each of us has developed or feels a sense of responsibility uh, for the world that we live in. And the second thing I think we all share is a sense of urgency that... Uh, the problems we're faced need to be solved in a, in a shorter timeline than the solutions currently presented to us. And so we each take our small piece of, of the problem set um, and, and bring to it some sense of responsibility and some sense of urgency. So I think in my case, it's the same as most of uh, um, my colleagues uh, and everyone here in this room. Thank you. It is two minutes to six o'clock, so let me uh, end the panel here. Uh, but first, let me thank all of you who have been here all day. It's been a fantastic day, and I hope you have gotten inspiration from pioneers. Let me thank Hernando, Tasso, and Noreen, of course, but through them, all the speakers, uh, speakers of the day who have done a wonderful job, not only of sharing their knowledge, sharing their passion, but actually inspiring us to challenge ourselves to achieve higher and higher goals. So thank you very much. And finally, let me end the day doing something which is probably inappropriate, but I can't resist. Stefan, after all the conversations we've had today that have to do with your vision, with your passion, with the support you have given most of the people who have come through this stage today. Let me just thank you on behalf of all of us, not only those of us who have already been touched by you, but all of those whom you have inspired today and will continue to inspire through the work we're now doing together with St. Gallen, with our organizations, and the people who, whom you have inspired in the past who are an example for a new generation of leaders who will eventually change the world. Thank you very much, Stefan. <laughs>